Our first speaker for this session is Dr. Sanjeev Saxena from Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. And uh, as he close, closely coming up, then he is going to speak to us on current trends in antiarrhythmic drugs. Dr. Saxena, thank you for coming to Kansas City. Thank you, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and to see the success of this meeting. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Lucky Reddy and all the uh, local organizers for the kindness and the hospitality you have extended to me in this visit. So um, I guess about once every five years I get asked to give an antiarrhythmic drug talk. Uh, and, uh, in the, and whenever I go, do this, I, I, I have to think a little bit about what those few years have taught us. Um, so I thought that it would be worthwhile stepping back and taking a look at the at sort of a global view of the field. And in atrial fibrillation, the rate and rhythm control discussion remains a perennial discussion. We've had, uh, as you know, eight major trials, uh, seven with major morbidity mortality endpoints. Four of them have had more than 500 patients. Overall, almost 7,500 patients have been enrolled. And none of them in the more, with the morbidity mortality endpoint trial showed be benefit, and one actually suggested harm. And after a firm was published, Al and I were there at the time of planning a firm, and certainly, I, and I was the token uh, non-pharmacologic rhythm control uh, person on the planning committee. We didn't have a lot of choices then. None of us, I think even George Weiss, had never expected the outcome. And Though we have adopted and the primary endpoint and its uh, interpretation, lingering doubts really still persist as to why this outcome came to be. Um, so the question really that must be asked is does rhythm control matter? I think we beat around the bush, but this is what a firm has put flatly in front of us. Does it matter at the age of 50 and beyond whether you're in sinus rhythm or not? Um, and what do we think about that? And after the database became um, available, there have been a, numerous post hoc studies, and uh, they've identified covariates and factors that could influence outcomes, and you can see a whole laundry list of, of these, starting with age and ending with digoxin and antiarrhythmic drug use. All of them... Um, Interesting, provocative, uh, hypothesis-provoking, but certainly speculative in what they mean. What they mean, and we truly do not understand beyond the fact that warfarin use it was certainly associated with better outcomes, and there were certain baseline characteristics that were associated with adverse results. So, about five, this slide is about five years old, and at that time we were still hoping for new drugs for atrial fibrillation, and there were target markers of ion channels in the atrium that were atrial specific. Uh, we had hopes of a, a variety of drugs that would come that would target these channels. Uh, we started looking at a variety of uh, uh, class of drugs, and as you can see uh, in that class were new class three drugs, such as dronedron. Uh, we thinking of drugs that had non-antiarrhythmic effects, that had anti-inflammatory effects, and then, of course, uh, uh, f uh, the NOACs were still in development. And therefore, we started getting quite excited about the possibility of a resurgence of an antiarrhythmic drugs that would become available and a variety of drugs to treat atrial fibrillation. Now take a look at the bottom set of panels in this slide, and if you can see five years later, many of these have left the development strategy. Many of them have had trials that have led to their being no longer developed. A few still survive, but the vast majority have come out without definitive benefit and in fact development limits. So some, for some years we have been reflecting on why is it that we have come into this situation and what, what is it that is causing this particular outcome? So let me back up a little. And, and, and so we looked back at atrial fibrillation and we looked at a firm and decided to look at whether we can learn more about outcomes by looking at individual antiarrhythmic drug behavior. 
Now, this was not a pre, pre, uh, predetermined analysis. And in fact, we vowed as a planning committee never to an analyze these results by antiarrhythmic drugs. So I had to reconvene the original project officer and some of the key members of planning committee uh, to get their buy-in to try and do this and to find a way that we could analyze these individual drugs without using statistically invalid methods. And we came through with the idea of doing a propensity score matching approach. And it was a pretty extensive propensity score match with 64 covariates with potential impact on the use and choice of an antiarrhythmic drug. Now when we look at these outcomes and we see what we've got, we find that in a variety of these covariates resulted in an extremely well-matched group of uh, patients. In fact, if you look at the, the, the red rectangles, there were only minor differences in these groups of patients who received amiodarone, sotolol, and class 1C drugs with matched rate control cohorts. And these are pretty highly matched for all of these variables. This analysis that was published about three years ago uh, we used the principal outcome of a composite of uh, first cardiovascular hospitalization and mortality. And with these corrections, every antiarrhythmic drug that was in, this, in these categories came out on the wrong side of the hazard ratio with an increased risk of the principal outcome. The cardiovascular hospitalization component really drove this composite uh, 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 outcome, and there was increased risk of death and after, and after CVH, if CVH happened as well. So you can see that all of the commonly used drugs, and we thought this analysis was still relevant because these drugs form the backbone of our antiarrhythmic therapy today, showed an excess risk. And if you did have a CVH, you had a two to three fold increase in the risk of death. But the only drug that showed an independent trend to excess mortality was amiodarone, mortality alone. This was really counterintuitive as to why would it be amiodarone. If you look at secondary outcomes where an ICU hospitalization was involved, and these hospitalizations were associated with enormous increase in risk of mortality, uh, eight to nine fold increases, only amiodarone showed an increased risk. And as you can see, the ICU hospitalization hazard ratios for six for amiodarone, 5.3 for sotolol, and nine for one C's in these situations. So what did we learn from this? We learned that there was really a role of the antiarrhythmic drug that was used in the active treatment arm in contributing to the overall outcomes in a firm. But what about the baseline characteristics? Did they affect the, each of these antiarrhythmic drugs? And we realized as we analyzed this further that that was indeed the case. Heart failure, the presence of that, and coronary artery disease, and diabetes adversely affected outcomes with every antiarrhythmic drug that was analyzed. Now, we don't think twice about using these drugs in patients with diabetes. We've been sensitized in patients with heart failure by a variety of studies. And in coronary patients, so we sometimes uh, favor things like sotolol rather than 1Cs. But we rarely consider that across the board, any of these and all three together would be ad an adverse indication for use of an antiarrhythmic drug, such as the ones in this study. And in addition, for certain categories, for example, for pulmonary disease with amiodarone and thyroid disease with amiodarone, there were specific individual risks that were noted. So that was baseline characteristics, where we are at when the patient comes to you and you decide to use an antiarrhythmic drug. What happens while you're using the antiarrhythmic drug? The patient has an episode of angina, an episode of heart failure, they get hospitalized, we continue the same antiarrhythmic drug. But actually the data suggests that if you have a worsening of your heart failure class, or if you have a worsening of your angina class, you're more likely to have an adverse outcome with the antiarrhythmic drug. 
If you revert out of sinus rhythm to atrial fibrillation, you have an adverse outcome. And if you lose rate control by 15 beats a minute or more, you have an adverse outcome. So how often do we reflect when the AF patient gets hospitalized on any of these factors as we are continuing the antiarrhythmic drug therapy? Let's take a look whether this bears on other drugs. This was, we looked at all the drugs that were in the firm, and then we had the uh, opportunity to look at a new drug, which was um, dronedarone. And the Athena study showed a positive hour impact on cardiovascular hospitalizations with this drug. That was the indication. And that was an unusual indication for an antiarrhythmic drug. In fact, everybody questioned whether this drug had antiarrhythmic effects or other effects. Well, if you look at this data and these outcomes and you go back to exactly what I just talked about, the baseline characteristics of the Athena patient, you will see that these factors, heart failure, coronary disease, et cetera, were present in less patients than other studies that I will show you. And in these patients, we had a more likely possibility that we started out with, the, with a kind of substrate that might not adversely react to antiarrhythmic drugs. But with the same drug, when you moved into a heart failure population, all of you know that we had an increase in mortality and as you can see from the, uh, from the data here, marked increase in the heart failure component. When PALAS was revisited, for just for rate control, now here, dronedrone was not being used for rhythm control, but just for rate control, and we had a major increase in adverse events and a termination of the trial. And the risk of the co uh, second co-primary iron point, unplanned hospitalization causes of death was also severely increased. You look back at the same characteristics, coronary artery disease, symptomatic heart failure, heart association class, previous MI, and diabetes mellitus, all in high proportion in this population. And the question then has to be asked that if we now have gone through four antiarrhythmic drug categories and we suddenly see just baseline characteristics that don't support the use of an antiarrhythmic drug in improving outcomes, what exactly is going on between those drugs and these situations? And then there are these special situations where there are specific conditions. So let's talk about thyroid disease. We all look for thyroid disease in a patient with atrial fibrillation when they first come along. But we really don't have a good trial of how atrial fibrillation and thyroid disease should be treated. No antiarrhythmic trial. So we, we culled out the data from a firm. And this, in a firm, 202 patients with thyroid disease received antiarrhythmic drugs. This is probably the largest experience ever reported. We've never really studied this group of patients, but there is no such data. Of these, 75 of these patients, of the AMIO propensity score MASH patients, 77 in Sotolol and 50 with INC had thyroid disease. There were MASH groups of rate control. And we looked at the overall outcomes for these endpoints. Now remember that these patients were matched specifically and very well. And if you look at these outcomes here, on the left is amiodarone, and if you look at the patients who got amiodarone and had thyroid disease, that's the line at the bottom, the blue-black line at the bottom that has the poorest outcome. And at the, by the time three years come, come along, 60% of patients have met the end point. Look at Sotolol. and Sotolol, you see again a worsening outcome with the use of the of the drug in the presence of thyroid disease. Rate control, interestingly enough, does not have that impact. And if you look at the 1C drugs, you see the same pattern again. So what you see here is that thyroid disease is a comorbidity in patients with atrial fibrillation by itself is not in, in associated with an increased risk of death or hospitalization when you use, for example, rate control. But amiodarone and sotolol in these patients increase the risk of CV hospitalization. 
and the hazard ratio goes as are shown here, both for the uh, for for, uh, for the combined endpoint and for cardiovascular hospitalization. Mortality, however, was comparable. So we talked about all the things that take the outcomes down with antiarrhythmic drugs. Does anything take the outcome up? Does anything make things better? So we've always lived in hope that restoration of sinus rhythm will improve outcomes. So we did a naive analysis about three years ago from the, from the, from the AFFIRM database, and we got some insight into this. And what we decided to do is to look at it in another way, which is not to see if sinus rhythm was restored, but how much sinus rhythm was restored. And what proportions of the follow-up visits was there, a sinus rhythm on the ECG? Because that's what we do in clinical practice. The patient comes to your office, you take an ECG, you take a pulse, you decide they're in sin rhythm control. And does that really matter? There was a suggestion on that naive analysis that there was an improvement in outcomes if less than 25% of follow-up visits were associated with, uh, with atrial fibrillation. And the outcomes were really let me just back up a second. The outcomes were really comparable to rate control. Now, so we went further, and this is a more detailed analysis that was presented earlier this year, and April Slee is really responsible for a lot of driving this work. And now we looked at matching these patients. And these are now matched patients with amiodarone and rate, who were then stratified for the percent of AF control. And you can see that we are looking at 700 odd patients in the amio rate group, 600 odd patients in the sotolol group, and about 250 patients in 1C group. It's pretty large numbers. And they're reasonably well matched. There are small inequities, like as you can see, that there's a little increase in uh, ejection fraction in the rate group with sotolol, which is uh, trivial, 79 to 80%, 14 to 10 uh, distribution-wise, and a little increase in LA diameter in the amio rhythm group, but nothing major. Now, the first interesting observation, I think, is shown here. What proportion of patients were in sinus rhythm at last follow-up with each of these drugs? And what about in, in rate control? Now, we've never looked at the affirm data in this light by drug, and interestingly enough, more patients were in sinus rhythm with the antiarrhythmic drug at last visit than were in the rate group, not a surprise. But what is interesting is the proportion of patients that were selected for these drugs responding to sinus rhythm was about the same. Now, what does that mean? It meant that, you know, one of the big criticisms in a firm was that we only randomized the antiarrhythmic drug in a substudy. Doctors chose the antiarrhythmic drugs based on clinical characteristics. But this is the outcome of what the doctors did, and they didn't do such a bad job. They got everybody up to a reasonable level that they achieved of sinus rhythm, because they chose the patients based on their characteristics. This is not to say that amio is not superior to sotolol, as was shown in some studies, but in the population that was selected, the other populations, the doctors didn't do a bad job. Now let's look at what happened to the principal outcome, stratified by the amount of time you were in sinus rhythm. So if you were in sinus rhythm more than 75% of the time on all the follow-up visits, look at the outcomes, and you can see that the patients on amiodarone who were in sinus rhythm less than 25% of the time were significantly increased in risk. Oops, I'm, let me just back. Of having an event than the patients who were in, not in sinus rhythm, uh, less, more than 75% of the time in sinus rhythm are in rate control. And the, you can see that uh, the hazard ratio here is 1.58 for amiodarone. If you look at cardiovascular hospitalization, the same pattern holds true. And you can see that if you have less than 75% sinus rhythm, you have a poorer outcome and you match rate control if you don't. If you look at death, there is a trend to increase, there is increased mortality if you have less than 25% sinus rhythm on amiodarone uh, than compared to any of the other categories. Now, many of us leave patients on amiodarone even when they revert to atrial fibrillation, just for the rate control of opportunity that it offers us. But this data actually suggests that we are increasing their risk of mortality. 
What about Sotalol? Well, Sotalol shows the same pattern of behavior. You have less than 75% sinus rhythm. You have an inferior outcome with Sotalol. And both in the 25 to 75 category, you're less than 25% sinus rhythm. CV hospitalization, same kind of data. Interestingly, no mortality effect. If you look at class 1Cs, if you fail to achieve more than 75% sinus rhythm, you're not doing the patient a service. CV hospitalizations with 1Cs, but fortunately, there is no mortality effect. What about early recurrences? So if you have a recurrence of atrial fibrillation, and Al's talked about it so many times about that one recurrence doesn't mean a failure of antiarrhythmic drug therapy, uh, what happens to these people at the end of the study? And if you look at what happens, if you have a recurrence of documented atrial fibrillation in the first four months of therapy, 26% of patients, 30% of patients in that range still achieve more than 75% sinus rhythm out at three years or so of follow-up. That was the cutoff in this study. So a single recurrence in the first four months does not imply inevitable failure. So really, it sets the stage for what we should be thinking about for what are the lessons for any antiarrhythmic therapy we, will, we look for. If you're going to try and restore sinus rhythm, you must get beyond a threshold. And if you're going to do an ablation and you have a recurrence and you, have, you don't have that 75% sinus rhythm time, don't, don't be shy, use an antiarrhythmic drug to get there because that's what, those are the kinds of implications that come from this data. And secondly, there are subgroups within the atrial fibrillation, pop we need to look at the atrial fibrillation population beyond the three Ps, paroxysmal, persistent, permanent. We need to look at their disease state, we need to look at whether they have diabetes, thyroid disease, what's progressing, what's not progressing. Are they making a visit to the hospital? We rethink heart failure therapy when the patient develops a creatinine elevation and we change over to hydralazine or whatever, but we seem to always persist with the same antiarrhythmic drug. So it's time to think a little differently about some of these issues. What about persistent AFib when the patient's more advanced in atrial fibrillation? This is the persistent AFib group in a firm. And look at what we've got. We've got the same you know, comorbidities, but now we have them in a much higher proportion across the board. We're going to, we, you can look at a variety of aspects of this, and you can see that these are now more likely to have a variety of prior problems and more cardioversions and more prior hospitalizations. And therefore, not surprisingly, all of these patients with persistent AFib have a poorer outcome uh, than matched patients, and for all of these antiarrhythmic drugs. In the persistent AFib group, death was non-significantly increased with amiodarone. The hazard ratio was 1.36, and the p-value was 0.08. Uh, but ICU hospitalizations were clearly more frequent as well. So let me step back and say, conclude by saying that antiarrhythmic drugs have taught us a lot, of, a lot about the treatment of atrial fibrillation. Many good things, many difficult things that we have to understand. And the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation ha not only have to be visited by rotors and drivers and pulmonary vein tachycardia, but they have to be revisited by the elements of the disease state. And the directions in AF therapy need to be not only just that for the arrhythmia, but also for the, the disease state. So for antiarrhythmic drugs, their outcomes are a composite of benefit from effective rhythm control in a, minor, in, a, in a subset of the patients that we achieve that, and potential adverse interactions with comorbidities, either due to a progressive disease or specific interactions with AF subgroups, such as patients with thyroid disease or pulmonary disease. And benefits from rhythm control may have a quantitative threshold to improve outcomes, and future clinical trials should really consider these issues in both patient selection and monitoring of rhythm control. Thank you very much for your attention.